A gospel reading this night comes from the book of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son. And they named him Jesus. Now in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is this child? who has been born king of the Jews. For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. May these words be to us our light and our life. Thanks be to God. The tree needs more lights. That's what I said to my family after we decorated our Christmas tree this year. It was about the same size tree as last year's, put in the same exact place in our dining room in front of the windows, and wrapped with the same strands of colored and white lights. But somehow, this year's tree needed more lights. Now, I think my family thought I was crazy, but I dashed to Menards and bought another extra long strand of colored lights on a green cord. Returning, I carefully wove this new strand in and amongst the already bedazzled boughs of our tree to add more light. I sat back 
and admired my work. Satisfied with the tree's now more radiant glow. It wasn't until later that I noticed how more than a few branches were bent over with the weight of the decorations and my extra lights. I realized then the tree didn't need more light. I did. Many of us find ourselves longing for more light in this season. Hate and violence has stepped boldly out from the shadows. Fears tightened its icy grip around everyone during a tense and divisive election. The deep drifts of uncertainty cover the path forward. Add to that any changes or challenges you might have had in your own lives, and most of us, I'd say, are ready for some good news. We are desperate for this great light of which Isaiah speaks, one that dispels hate, that melts our fear, and is both a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Now, in all honesty, adding lights to my Christmas tree is probably a healthier response than sneaking those late night snacks of Christmas cookie dough and having that extra, extra glass of wine. I entered Advent needing to wrap myself in some Christmas cheer. I hope that seeing my childhood decorations Lighting the Advent candles, singing the 12 days of Christmas with my cousins, and making my mother's favorite candy cane bars, all would bring some reassurance and comfort. But the bent branches of our Christmas tree suggest I have some unrealistic expectations of Christmas this year. When we finally get to this night, the true meaning of Christmas. We discover it isn't about helping us sleep better. It's about waking us up. The birth of Jesus according to the Gospel of Matthew was written long after Jesus' death. It's a parable really of sorts reflecting I think the real experience of the adult Jesus back onto imagined birth story. Its themes are personal and universal. It is both rooted in the history of the ancient Near East and yet still speaks to a 2016 world. Matthew focuses on Joseph. It begins with Joseph discovering that his fiancée Mary is mysteriously pregnant. Angry and afraid of what this will mean for him and for her, Joseph plans to do what anyone would have done in his time. What was expected? Leave her. But a dream disquiets his comfortable plans. In the dream, the angel says to Joseph, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For this child is holy. He is the promised one, Emmanuel, God with us. Now at the time, Caesar held the titles of Lord, Son of God, Savior, Prince of Peace. This gospel reclaims those titles and gives them to Jesus. Now, far from making things easier, Joseph wakes up to a new dilemma made more urgent by the angel's promises. Joseph was probably tempted to shrug this impossible calling off as just a bad dream and go back to sleep. But something about the presence of God in this child compelled him to stay awake. 
God is with us, he is told. And so, instead of resisting the impossible, he moves with it. Going against expectations and his own fear, he stays, he stays with Mary. And she does have a son, and they name him Jesus. Now, meanwhile, in the east, an unusual star disturbs the night sky. Wise men see it and know the stars reveal divine mysteries and offer guidance to those who pay attention. What, oh, what can this mean? The star leads them to Bethlehem and rests over the place where Jesus is born. The wise men pay homage to this child as they would a king. Jesus somehow represented a cosmic shift, both in the wise men's mystical world of consciousness, but their arrival also carries extra meaning for the first century readers of this story. For deep in their cultural memory is how God's people were once conquered and forced into exile by the powers of the East. And now, with this child, the ancestors of their oppressors pay homage to their future king. This reversal foreshadows the divine justice Jesus will reveal to the world. A turn the other cheek, lion with the lamb, love your neighbor kind of justice. Inspired by the limitless promise of this child, the wise men resist helping Herod in his jealous quest to destroy the baby. And having been warned in a dream themselves, they chose to return home by another road. And what about Herod? We don't often read Matthew's birth story on Christmas Eve because of Herod. He's actually one of the real historical figures in this unfolding drama. He represents the corruption and violence in the world, something that is hard to stomach, along with the peanut brittle and the Christmas goose, perhaps. But theologian Brian McLaren argues that we should keep Herod the Great in our Christmas story. He was the puppet king of Judea installed by the Romans because they expected that Herod, a Jew, would be able to maintain control in the region. So in this story, after hearing rumors of the birth of a new Jewish king, Herod set out to destroy any hope of rebellion inspired by this child. This too would have sounded all too familiar to a first century audience who remember how Pharaoh had tried to stop the rise of the Hebrew people when they were slaves in Egypt by killing its children. Once again, Joseph is warned in a dream and told to take Jesus and Mary and flee. Where? To Egypt, of all places. This child must be protected. He represents hope for a different kind of Jewish kingship than Herod's, one guided by love. In him, the lines between friend and enemy would be blurred. With him, possibilities for forgiveness would be opened. Through him, a path to peace was illuminated. McLaren writes, Yes, Jesus has truly come, but each year during the Advent season, we acknowledge that the dream for which he gave his all has not yet fully come. As long as elites plot violence, as long as children pay the price, as long as mothers weep, we cannot be satisfied.
tonight, as we gather here, this sanctuary will be filled with a wondrous light. It breaks forth from the dreams and the stars that awaken us. It illuminates the glorious impossible that God is calling forth from within each one of us in these times. It ignites our resistance to injustice and makes known the path to peace. And the angel said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. In Christ, there is light enough to meet you in your deepest longings. For now we know, God is with us. Amen.